Hello, this is Joe Neville, and in this video, I'm going to be talking about Aruba, AOS CX, and VRFs. We'll be looking at the theory, and then I'll be showing you a VRF configuration demo. VRF stands for Virtual Routing and Forwarding, and is a means to segment our router resources. VRFs are one of the building blocks that can be used to create certain types of VPNs, but you should bear in mind that their configuration is only locally significant. The VRF configuration on one device is not advertised to its neighbours, so this device over here might not know anything about VRFs. And if you're new to VRFs, you may be wondering why I'm emphasising that fact early on, but as we dive deeper into VRS, especially when we look at how they're deployed as part of a real network in the wider scheme of VPNs, I'm hoping that the importance of this fact will become more apparent to you. Let's dive a little deeper into the theory of VRS then by starting with an example and thinking about a layer 3 device that's configured with no VRF. So what we have here are an L3 device and we've got three physical ports connected to three nodes. So these layer one ports, they populate the global tables of our device. And what do I mean by global tables? Well, for example, we have a global routing table on this device. So our layer three table and the IP addresses that are configured on these physical ports, those are the subnets that populate the routing table because they are connected. So the layer three device knows how to reach them because it has layer three interfaces configured in those subnets. So that's what we can see here. But not only that, we have a global ARP or if we're running IPv6 and why wouldn't we, we'll have a neighbor cache. So that we'll have a single one of those and that's where we map our known layer three addresses and our layer two hardware addresses. So we've got our IP addresses, our MAC addresses and the ports. And this is all in global. And all other things being equal, our nodes will have connectivity to each other via these global tables. Now the principle behind VRFs, as mentioned, is to segment our router resources. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we assign ports to VRFs. With AOS CX, this is called VRF attach. So attaching a VRF to a physical port or a layer three port. So it could be uh, a VLAN interface layer three port. So in this example, what I've done for illustrative purposes, I've placed one slash one slash five and one slash one slash seven in VRF red and I've placed one slash one slash eight in VRF blue. And what that will do is it will divide up our table. So we'll have VRF dedicated routing tables. So they won't look like this. Don't go looking for this on a device. This is just to kind of illustrate the port, but essentially it takes the routing table and divides it into the subnets that are configured to the ports that are attached to VRF red are here and the subnets for the port that are attached to blue are here. Now these are segmented now. So all other things being equal, blue and red are now separate. But not only the routing table, also our our poor neighbor cache. So that's divided up per VRF as well. So now our connectivity has been segmented so the node connected to one slash one slash five will be able to speak to one slash one slash seven so we'll be able to go from here to here but this node will not be able to speak to these two nor will they be able to speak to that one because the tables have been divided up into the relevant VRFs. And before we go any further, a quick word about Aruba, AOS CX and its default VRFs. So that theoretical example that I was giving is a more legacy design where you would have a device that was, if it wasn't configured with, our, with any VRFs, everything would just be in its global tables. So you wouldn't need to, so you wouldn't see VRFs anywhere until you started to configure them and then they would be in addition to the global tables. But CX takes a different approach and it harnesses VRFs 
from the very start. So there's no actual global tables with CX. There's actually two factory default VRFs. One of them is like a global table. So this is a VRF default, it's in the name. Okay, so this is for the front panel port as I've signified here and essentially for your user data. Now this isn't just default by name, this is actually the default. So if you run show IP root or show up, you're actually seeing the tables for VRF default. You don't have to put in VRF default, but that's what it will, that's what the device will be showing you. But we also have VRF MGMT. So this is for your management. Okay, so this is the dedicated management port on the front of the, this is an 8320. That port is automatically designated as part of VRF management and that's to keep your management traffic separate from your front panel port user data but for our purposes here what we're going to be doing is we're going to be concentrating on vrf default and then user assigned vrs that we configure let's dive into the demo then so here i have my cx device it is an 8320 with four physical ports which are connected to my four nodes here they're all ubuntu servers but i've given them host names which kind of designate a role for them in the network so over here i've got red server and blue server and then i've got red client and blue client so to start with we have a full mesh of connectivity so red client will be able to ping red server blue server and blue client and blue client will be able to ping all of its neighbors here but what we're going to do is segment the cx device with a VRF red and a VRF blue. We're gonna run through the configuration, look at the tables, so the routing table and the ARP cache, etc., and we'll be able to segment the CX device such that the red client can only speak to the red server and the blue server and the blue client have connectivity, thus creating a very simple VPN, but blue client will no longer have connectivity to red server or red client and vice versa. Okay, let's dive into the demo then and get configuring the devices. I'll leave the demo diagram up on screen. And top right, I've got my 8320 that we're going to configure. So that's this device. And then down at the bottom here, I've got color coded my client. So red client and blue client. At the moment, everything is just in VRF default. So they can ping all the other nodes. So if we try to ping from red client to red server, that works. Ping blue server and ping blue client. So which one's that? 8.5. There we are. Uh, and blue client can ping. Let's do some V6 on this guy. So let's ping red server. Good. Blue server. Okay, right. I think that's enough to um, demonstrate that. Let's set off these pings then. So we'll go from red client to red server with V4. And I'll go blue client to red server with V6. Let's set that off. Okay, now the 8320, let's do a show version. This is running the latest version of code at the time that I'm recording this, which is 10.4.20. Show you the configuration. It's pretty basic stuff. Um, yeah, so oh, there's the VRF MGMT for my SSH. So going into that dedicated port, but everything, and then the interface management is actually in that, I should say, but everything else is in VRF default. It just doesn't show up. So I've configured these four physical ports with the V4 and the V6 addresses that they need to create this connectivity here. Um, and if we do a show VRF, you will see that we actually have, as I mentioned, we have factory default, we have a VRF default, okay? And you'll see all of the front panel ports uh, in that, most of them are down, and these 1 slash 1 slash 5 to 1 slash 1 slash 8, which are up, 
they are in there and they are sending traffic within that VRF. OK, now let's have a look at the routing table. And the thing is that the routing table and the so show IP route and show IP route VRF default. These are, of course, the same thing. You just don't need to put in the VRF default. And in here we can see the subnets that are connected to those four ports all populating our VRF default to our global. Same with the ARP cache. You don't have to put VRF default, but it's the same thing. And also IPv6, it is IPv6 neighbor to show the neighbor cache. Okay, but what we're going to do is we're going to create a couple of new VRF. So VRF red and VRF blue, and we're going to assign our physical ports into that. So how do we create a VRF? Well, that's very simple. Let's go into conf and it's VRF question mark there. So we just enter the VRF name, VRF red. Right now there are other options in here. So address family, root distinguisher, for example, you don't need to enter those for this very simple uh, demonstration to just show you VRFs. You don't actually need things like a root distinguisher. So we can come out of that. That's This is all we need to create the VRF. And then what I should do is let's have a look at the configuration for the ports that we're going to attach this VRF to. And you'll see why in a moment. So let's go uh, the VRF attach to put a port into a VRF, so essentially bringing it out of default and putting it into our new user-created VRF, we go into the port and we do VRF. If we do a question mark there, you'll see that command attach. So attach and then the name of the VRF. Now hit that and what happens? Well, our packets have started to fail and you'll see why if we do a show run interface on the interface that I've just configured there. When you move uh, an interface, so a physical interface, or I should mention also it can be a layer three interface or a VLAN interface, into a new VRF, it strips off the IP addresses. So that's just something to bear in mind. That's why I brought the IP addresses up on screen so I can just copy those back in. So let's do that. And we need to do the same then with one slash one slash seven. So we do VRF attach red, that will take the IP addresses off. So I'll copy and paste those that I had there back in and we should be good. Okay, we do have connectivity, but that is red client to red server. So what's going on here? Well, one slash one slash five and one slash one slash seven are now in VRF red. We segmented our router resources here and blue is now isolated. So one slash one says eight doesn't have a connection to red server or red client. So that's what we're seeing here. Now let's have a look at the tables. I'll come out of here. So uh, what show IP root. If we do that. So now we've lost the subnets. Okay, out of the so this is the V4 V6 root. So all we can see is six and eight. So these two here are still in global. And to see what's going on within VRF red, we need to do a show IP root VRF red. OK, so so it's five, this subnet and this subnet, which are now within that VRF. Same deal with if you want to look at the ARP table for a VRF, you have to put in show ARP and then VRF name okay so there are the entries bring that across there are our entries there and you can see here vrf red and also we have the v6 neighbor cache so that can be vrf as red as well now that's not populated because i'm pinging at v4 so these aren't known at the moment okay let's go ahead and create our second vrf then so vrf blue and it doesn't really make too much sense to carry on with this configuration uh, with this ping so i'll stop that and let's go from blue client to blue server then so let's ping 
six ten there. Okay, and it camping at the moment, of course, because it is actually in a VRF. It's in VRF default, so that still has connectivity across here. It's just not in our user assigned VRF at the moment, which we're going to do. So same thing again, VRF blue, and come come out of there. And what were the ports? So it's one slash one slash six. Let's bring up the config actually. And one slash one slash eight. Okay, so I'm in one slash one slash six, and I do a VRF attach blue. Okay, so that stops this. No effect over here because that's just going red to red. And we need to put in the IP addresses. And we go one slash one slash eight, and I do attach blue. Once this goes on, we should have our connection back. And we do. Okay, so blue can ping blue and red can ping red. Now, what happens if I try to ping from red to blue? So if I go 6.10, of course it can't. Okay. And then if you wanted to have a look at the V4 routing table for blue, so it's VRF blue and v6 table VRF blue okay ah, and i should also say if you do a show ip route now we don't have any layer 3 ports in vrf default so nothing's in global nothing's in vrf default so nothing will show up there they're now assigned to our new vrfs and Rather than having to put in the VRF type every time, what you can do, question mark there, you, we've got this option here. So all VRFs. So if we do that, there we go. All VRFs up here. And you can see the different VRFs. So this is a really useful command because you've got the blue and you have the red there. So you can see all of that consolidated into a single table. Same with... ARP, there we go, all VRFs, same with, of course, neighbor cache and V6. There we go, blue and red. That's the end of that demo. So just a single device demo to try to really illustrate the fundamental workings of VRFs. We started off with four physical ports all in global. And when we're dealing with CX, that means VRF default. And all nodes had connectivity to each other. We created a couple of new VRFs, VRF red and VRF blue. And we took our physical ports and we attached them to those VRFs. And at that stage, we saw that red server and red client had connectivity. And blue server could ping blue client, but blue could not ping red and vice versa. We also saw how the layer three table, so the routing table, had been divided up into the relevant VRS and also the ARP cache and the V6 neighbor tables have been divided up. So now rather than just having VRF default, we had VRF red routing table and ARP and we had VRF blue routing table and ARP. Okay, so if you're new to VRS, I hope you found that useful. And in the next video, what I'll be doing is I will be looking at a more realistic scenario where you have multiple devices and multiple VRS and the implications of that. So just expanding upon these themes. But that's all for this video. Thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate you clicking and viewing this video. Just leaves me to say my name's Joe Neville. Thanks for watching and goodbye.